Welcome to Right On, the podcast from Final Draft. This is the show where we talk about all things screenwriting. I'm your host, Phil Galasso. On today's episode, guest host Sade Sellers chats with Axel Carolyn, writer-director of the new film, The Manor, which is part of Amazon's Welcome to the Blumhouse series. I wasn't ready for this change, but my prognosis isn't good. You don't belong here. Don't worry, I'll be okay. Whatever's coming next, I don't want my family to see me like that. How do you like your new home? It's beautiful. Takes a bit of time, but you'll fit right in. Anyone there? Are you okay? Last night, I saw something. What was it? Not being able to distinguish between what's real and what's a dream. That's a sign of dementia. Whatever I've seen at night, it's real. Mom, we all want you to feel better. Why won't you believe me? I need to get out of this place. The only way you're getting out of here is in a box. Look at these names. My roommate, she died last night. All the others have died too. I'm not crazy. When you experience something disorienting, close your eyes and count to five. When you open them again, Whatever you saw or heard will be gone. Axel told us about how the film deals with ageism, how films like The Fly and Reanimator inspired her, working with legendary producer Sandy King, and more. Check it out. Welcome back, everyone, to Ride On. It's Sharday here again, and I have such a great guest with me today. I just watched her movie last night, actually, and I am obsessed, and we have so much to talk about. I'm here with Axel Carolyn from the new feature film that's going to be included in the Welcome to Blumhouse special portion at Amazon, which is premiering October 8th. This is The Manor. Hi, Axel. Hey. <laughs> okay, so Hi. They, they sent me the movie last night. It was kind oh, of wow. short notice, but I was... I was so excited because I love horror films and I, I know you love horror films. Like you can't, I just can't see her room, but this room is epic. I mean, <laughs> I could spend all day going over. I know that Sam from trick or treat, that's Frankenstein in your background. So like, I'm so obsessed with your room. We could make a game out of it. Um, There's oh, a lot of monsters in, in this and I'm trying to hide the fact that I have the monster from the movie as well. Ah, okay. Well, no one can see that. Just me. No. So, but I want, I'll ask you about that in a second. What I want to tell you, first of all, is don't feel bad. This movie made me cry. Oh, and it probably wasn't an intention, <laughs> obviously, because you're, you're, you're just trying to make a movie. You're a filmmaker, but it was very poignant for me to see this movie because I just lost my grandma. Um, oh my God. I'm so sorry. Thank you. Uh, this is my second grandma on my mother's side. I lost my father's grandma three years ago, and she specifically was staying in a home like this, not as grandiose as the manor, but a home. And it made me so unbearably sad to have to go visit her in that home because she would always tell me they don't listen to me. No one believes me. And so watching your movie brought up a lot of those memories about us having conversations and what it was like for her getting older. And it, I'm sure you didn't mean to do it, but it, it was just nice that it felt like I wasn't the only one dealing with this. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry that it made you feel sad. And I, I, I would be lying if I said I haven't hoped that a little portion of the audience would feel that way because it's, it's also based on, I had similar experiences, you know, I saw my dad and my granddad both go to nursing homes and I, I saw how it changed them and it changed the way that People look at them and people speak to them. And and I think that when people address you a different way, you become someone else as well. And so I, I very much saw that. And, and those were experiences that struck me and that were the basis for writing this. So I tried to stay away from anything that was too heavy or too dark or too depressing. And even in the choice of the house that we picked and, and 
because I didn't want it to be a very heavy experience watching this. It's not the point of the movie, but I can't, you know, those experiences are mine and they, they come through in any case, I suspect. And, and it's part of the subject matter. Which is a part of the brilliance of not only your writing, but your directing. Because when I was watching it, I, I was writing questions. And I go, no, this person's experienced this because there's certain things, there's mi- small things, right? Like even the lunch the lunch scenes where they're in lunch. I was like, you can't, you can't make that up in research. You have to have experienced seeing a loved one there in this facility. So I, I definitely was hoping that that's what your answer was going to be that you've lived through this. Cause I felt that you had by watching the film. I was like, this feels a little personal. <laughs> for Thank me. you. Well, that's, that, that means a lot. That's awesome. Um, yeah. Yeah. And, and there's many little things. I mean, the, the basic, for the basis of the story came from, visiting my granddad and my granddad didn't have dementia. He had his full head mm-hmm. all the way to the end. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and nonetheless, he was lying in bed and I was sitting on the chair with my back to the door and he tells me who's at the door. And I look back and there's nobody. And, and I tell him there's no one there. And he says, there's, I can see someone standing right there in the door frame. My first instinct was obviously to dismiss it and just think, you know what, he's probably, yeah. it's old age, his, his sight, his mind, like whatever. And then it kind of stuck with me that he's in bed. He can't move. Some people even get tied in their bed because they tend to thrash around and fall. So like you're really restricted to the house that you can't leave, the room that you can't leave, the bed that you can't leave. Sometimes your physical self that doesn't allow you to run away and, and whatever happens to you, people are not going to believe you. And so it felt, it felt very scary. And that idea of my dad also, that was very strongly kind of the emotional core of of the the story when I was writing it, but he had dementia and the last five years of his life, he was a college professor. And then I saw him changed into a completely different person. And that was very difficult to deal with. And he would wake up at night. And my mom said he woke up this one night and he looked around and he told my mom, you don't mind all those people watching us while we sleep. And, uh, and it's those little things where it's kind of like, well, no one will believe you. And you're experiencing those things and it must be terrifying and how scary and sad. And, and yeah, so all that felt like it was both very personal subject matters, fears that I have that are very genuine and personal to me, but that also are universal themes that I'd like to address in the way that we talk about old age and the way that we talk to people of a certain age. And then the fact that it's a perfect setting for a horror movie because of the fact that you can't escape and because you're vulnerable. And a, a part of me also, especially dealing with my grandmother and watching this movie was like, oh, I understand the staff's point of view as well. And it's it's very hard because you know, they're not, no, no one's an asshole in this, right? Because the staff is doing their job and they deal with this all the time. So of course, when someone's screaming, there's a person in my room, they're doing this, they're going to say, Well, it's unfortunate that their mind is being lost. So I see both sides of it because the the staff at my grandmother's home was very lovely. Mm -hmm. But in terms of crafting your characters for the the script when you were working on it, how far did you want to go with making a villain that's ominous, number one, but also the staff in this show? Like how far? Because I'm sure you, you didn't want to bring any malice to people who work these jobs. Like we all know that it's a, it's a tough job, but some of them aren't great at the job and they should probably shouldn't be doing the job. So what's the balance between there? Of like, this is how I feel. This is my experience versus not everyone does this. Right. So it's, it's, it's hard to discuss without revealing too much, but right. But I, I think the people who deal with I have the greatest admiration for people who work in nursing homes. So I definitely don't want to paint them as the bad guys in any kind of way. Anything that may be done that seems shady is done because there's an ulterior motive that's related to the plot of the story. None of it is meant to be criticism of the staff there. If there's any criticism on my end, it's just, it's not directed at them. It's directed at the way that society views old age. And one of the things that I really wanted to try to do is, you know, when I think of myself in in 30 or 40 years, I find that idea very scary. And I think that having seen loved ones in a nursing home and having seen them change, it's, it's very difficult to think of the future. And so one of the reasons I think it's also scary is that, especially as a woman, you don't see a lot of role models. You don't see a lot of people you can look up to on TV who are represented in movies, who are charismatic and cool, and not just kind of like would you like some tea, dear? You know, not yes, the, the, yes. the little granny that I know I'm not going to become. This is not going to happen. And so I wanted to write characters on that side who were, especially with the lead with Judith, I wanted to write a character who was going to be someone I want to be when I'm that age. Someone that 
is is fun and her grandson hangs out with her because she is funny not because just because she's the, the grandmother but because she is someone you want to spend time with she's charismatic she's strong she doesn't take shit from people she's just she's exactly the way that i'd like to imagine myself in the future and and there are so many women who i look up to so much and i wish that we saw them more in positions of power in positions of you know i think that seeing lynn shea in horror movies is fantastic she's so yes, funny lynn seeing shea. sigourney weaver out there like with judy dench like there's so many fantastic performance performers of that age but yeah and and then funny also when i was writing judith a lot of people who read the script said that's not the way that older people speak they don't use the f word they don't and I'm like yes they do i met my <laughs> grandmothers <laughs> you know but i was still kind of hitting that cliche of, of the, the little kind of lifting your little finger and drinking tea and yes. you know? well it's funny you say that because there was a moment in the film and this isn't a spoiler it's a wardrobe thing drew's wearing this like octopus sweatshirt and i go that's the dopest shirt i've ever seen <laughs> and i want it and i was just like it's so cool she just looks awesome what i really love also about and i want to know more about what decision you had to make about this because i I loved the grandson grandma relationship because my brothers are twins and they're 17. They were obviously very young when our grandparents passed away, but they had that same relationship. They, they didn't think they were too cool to hang out with grandma, right? Like that was their friend. That, that was the girl that they were going to go talk to. So, I mean, what was the decision-making when you were writing the script to go, I want to talk about this type of relationship between grandson and grandmother rather than granddaughter and grandmother. I think we don't see much of it. And, and it was just, it felt a little bit more unexpected, I think. And it felt like one of the things that it's not explicitly in the script, but it made it in the script at some point Then we removed it. Then it was kind of, you know, it went in and out. It's, sometimes you don't need to give all that information, but you just need to know it was building the fact that maybe grandma was a little bit more allowing him to do things that his mother was too strict to allow. Mm. And maybe they had a, a love of horror movies in common, which is why they're wearing, they're both wearing black a lot. They're wearing t-shirts that she's not wearing a horror movie t-shirts, but she has like the octopus t-shirt. Yeah. Like visually, yeah. they kind of mirror each other. She's like a more refined version of the way that he dresses in some ways. It's just kind of giving them interests in common and personality traits that might mirror each other so that you would understand beyond the family bond why those two people love each other so much. And and there was something about, you know, my grandma was not, she was not like Judith. She was very different type of personality and, and she was very much of her age, but she was the one thing, I mean, many things about her were super cool, but she did get excited about things that I liked that my parents thought were not appropriate, like mm -hmm. Bruce Lee movies or like, yeah. you know, I, I was obsessed with like The Fly and Edward Scissorhands when yes. I was little. And my parents thought that this was, even Edward Scissorhands for them looked too scary and not appropriate for a 12 year old. And, and so I would watch them at my grandma's and my grandma would record stuff off TV and she'd be like, oh, I got this movie. Like, do you want to watch that? And she wouldn't necessarily know what the movie was, but she just knew that I had both. But you liked it. And, yes. Yeah. Yeah. That's such a grandma thing. My grandmother, my on my father's side is very religious, both of them were, but um, she wasn't into witchcraft, witchcraft or any of that stuff, but she was the first person to buy me the Harry Potter book when it came out because she knew I liked to read. And she said like, this is not my thing. I don't believe in this, but, and then from that year forward for every Harry Potter book that came out, she would write in the pocket of the book, like, this is not my thing. I don't <laughs> encourage this, but I hear this is a really good series and you seem to like it. So I love that because grandparents, that's, so that's what they do. <laughs> yeah. And then they, they allow you to, I mean, for Harry Potter, I'm sure that I don't know if you were a big reader at the time, but, but sometimes you need that way into books that isn't necessarily, I was right. always a, a big reader, but my parents didn't like the fact that I, I picked up Stephen King books when I was like 10 right, or 11. Right. And, but still they didn't, that they didn't stop because they felt like at least she's reading. Yeah. And, and exactly that she, again, she's not into witchcraft. She was not into <laughs> of that stuff, you know, the devil, but she knew I was, and I really was interested in, in horror and Halloween and witches. And she's like, as long as you're like reading and educating yourself, like this could be fun for you. So such pleasant relationships we have with our grandparents when we're lucky to have them. Mm -hmm. Now let's go back to Let's talk about these movies that you just named, The Fly, Edward <laughs> Hands. Like, what a, what a way to grow up. Me and my sister are very close. My birthday is October 21st, and she's September 28th. So we um, bond over horror, and you seem to be a horror aficionado. And now you're working with Blumhouse, which is like the dream for horror creators. But what was that one horror film that was like, yep, 
this is what I'm going to do with the rest of my life. I watched this and now I know I have to make this. I think it was weirdly, it was a, a combination of David Cronenberg's The Fly, which yes. kind of taught me the power of characters and emotion in a horror movie, even though you have all the, the disgusting special effects and all the cool makeups and all those things, but it makes you feel something very genuine and, and the power of being able to make someone cry as they're also scared or disgusted is, is just so, it's so wonderful. And, and you can express so much through horror movies that isn't yes. just, you know, there's so many metaphors that you can, you can put in there without hitting people on the head with them. It was a combination of that. And then I saw Stuart Gordon's reanimator and that just felt like it would be working on that set would have been the most fun yes. thing in the world. And that felt like, you know, in, in some ways, because it's very low budget and it's very contained and felt like, oh, this is, this is doable. This is something I can actually achieve. Like maybe not specifically that movie or that type of movie, but like, this right. is the kind of, oh, filmmaking is a thing that people can actually do. Yes. So you don't need to be wow. born in LA and you don't need to be like, English wasn't even my first language. I, I There were so many barriers. And then you see something like this and like, well, I can, you know, we can put this together and make something right. And it just takes work. And that's it. That's how I felt the first time I watched um, John Carpenter's The Thing. I was like, wait, this is, this has opened me up to, <laughs> to possibilities. <laughs> like, I want to do this. I want to write about this stuff. This is amazing. Horror I'm talking about like living the horror dream. It's not just working for Blumhouse or working on TV shows as I get the chance to do right now. It's also, this movie is produced by Sandy King who is the badass producer of John Carpenter movies since the late yes. 80s. And she is phenomenal. Yeah, just getting to work with her and having her support me and having her, like, she's so fierce and so kind of supportive in, in every way of what I was doing. And then we were working, we were shooting around the time of Halloween and it had been kind of a tough shoot to put together. And she felt like the crew could need a little pick me up or a little. And she invited John Carpenter to visit the set on Halloween day. And I mean, it was, you can imagine. And so I show up in the morning and I'm dressed like a witch. I have a big pointy hat. It looks really silly. And, and everybody in the crew is dressed up. And then suddenly it's like, Oh, John is visiting on lunchtime. John, John, what John Carpenter. <laughs> It was wonderful. It was also the first day that we worked with the monster on set. So everything was just, it was just a perfect day. It was the best Halloween. Oh my gosh. That is so, that's like, a, that's just the fangirl a little bit. It's my, one of my good friends is an actor and he was in a movie that Bob Shea directed and he was like, oh, it's no big deal. And I was like, are you kidding me? And I made right? send emails on behalf of me to, to Bob Shea to say, so can I ask you about these questions about Nightmare on Elm Street? Can we talk about this really quick? And Bob wrote back like, who is this? I was like, it's just a fan. It's just a fan. He had no idea who he was. And I was like, let me break this education down for you. You are dealing with a, a genius producer here at this time. That's and then awesome. I feel, I feel very closely the way you feel about, uh, I feel about John Carver. I wish I had a moment like that with Wes Craven. Like that's the one thing I always say, if I could have dinner with anyone dead or alive, it'd be Wes Craven. Like, please come back to oh, me. I have. <laughs> you had dinner with Wes? Is he amazing? Yes. Is he amazing? Like, he was, he was lovely. I, I met him a bunch of times. I met him at a masters of horror dinner, which is one of those amazing dinners that Nick Gears puts together for yeah. directors. I also visited the set when I was a writer for Fangoria for Hills of Eyes and Hills of Eyes 2. And he was on the set of Hills of Eyes 2. And I have a picture where we're both smoking a hookah together. Oh my God, <laughs> dream. You'll, okay, you'll have to show me that picture. He's, he's my idol. He's my, I mean, you, you guys can't see it, but my screen poster here is is in my phone. It has a, it's a screen case. Like I'm, oh wow. Obsessed. So it's, he's very dear to me. And I'm hoping, you know, as we're talking about, this isn't your first trip into horror. People don't know. I mean, you, I believe produced and wrote and start, or maybe acted in Tales of Halloween. That was your project. I, I started out, I made right. a feature when I lived in England called Soulmate, right. which is very small budget that I wrote and directed back in 2014. And then when I moved to LA, I made an anthology feature with a bunch of my friends who are all directors. And I produced that uh, with Epic Pictures and then directed and wrote a segment of it. Yeah. And yeah, then I've done a lot of TV work as well. I was a writer on yeah. Adventures of Sabrina. I just directed some American Horror Story. I directed I an episode of 
Haunting of Bly Manor. Um, yes, I was going to say creep that. show and yeah. <laughs> and uh, Midnight Mass coming up. Midnight Club is the one I worked on. So Midnight oh. Mass is Mike Flanagan directed yes. all of it. And that's the one that comes out now. And right. then Midnight Club, he directed the first two. And then I did two episodes on it. And that's based on Christopher Pike books. And that comes out next year. Yes. Yeah, so that's wonderful. Speaking of Bly Manor, one of my good friends, Jeff Howard, who works very closely with Mike Flanagan. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's just a small world. The horror, the horror world is small. So I'm very grateful that we were able to meet each other. I want to ask you just, I mean, first of all, I'm so grateful. And and this may seem cliche that there's more women in horror getting more opportunities, especially women who actually like horror. Sometimes when I interview people, they dibble and dabble in the genre because it's easy and it's going to make low, you know, low budget, high, Mm -hmm. but I really do enjoy when I meet other women who actually love the genre, who want to (laughs) do the genre, who's not going to just bail after their first feature and go do like serious dramas for, you know, high end studios. Like this is your, this is your genre, but I want to talk about the fear. Like we touched slightly on it earlier, but I want to go back to it because I'm a narcissist and I need to know your fear of mortality. What piece of that really gets you is it forgetting who you are like you mentioned with your dad like you know having all these experiences and not remembering them is it the aging thing because even at 32 my body wakes up a different age every day and today it was 95 (laughs) and that scares scares me literally I'm like I'm only 32 what is it going to be like when I'm 40 but I want to know for you like what's the fear that that drives you (laughs) It's all of it. It's all of it. It's losing your loved ones. It's, you know, it's, it's losing my dog, <laughs> you know, yeah. seeing my dog get older, like seeing people around me change. And then, and then myself, I think part of it is, I don't think I have the fear so much of the physical side of it because I haven't experienced so many changes yet. You know, I'm not, I'm not 70, <laughs> but I'm, I'm, I, it's, it's less that like, you know, my back doesn't hurt. And it, you know, oh, I, it, it's more, I think it's that perception that you kind of become someone else and that yeah. people look at you in a different way. And that the way that I think people perceive you in different ways, according to your age in any case. And it sometimes has nothing to do with you. And as a woman, I think it's especially true. A woman who turns 40 or 50 will be looked at very differently from a woman who's 30. And then when you turn 60 or 70, it's yet a different kind of way of what we find interesting or what we find cool or what we find attractive changes with age. And it's disorienting and it's a little bit scary. And it's a little bit of like, we have such a strange and restrictive idea of what a woman should be at every age. And it's kind of like, how do I fit into that? Or how do I not fit into that? But then how do I keep, you know, how do I keep being myself? And it seems like it's a very intellectual way of looking at aging. But when I, when I think of why it scares me, I think these are parts of that. And then, yeah, dementia would absolutely suck. <laughs> yes, yes. Right. Mine is this, mine is this smell. Like I, every day I realize that I'm decaying and I'm like, do I smell <laughs> like that's just my biggest fear. I'm like, I'm sweating more profusely as I get older. I'm taking more showers. I'm just like, I just don't, I just don't want to smell me, my body decaying, but that's just, I feel like I do. Um, small little narcissistic thing, but okay. <laughs> I only have a couple of questions left. Cause I know you're, you're shooting this week, correct? I you're am. Yes. Else. Are yeah, you I'm shooting the season finale of American horror story. Awesome. That's so fun. Cool. Yeah. That's a great, I love that, that anthology. We, um, at our little horror podcast, we always talk about the, the season. So I can't wait to see the season finale for this new one. Cause this new season's really throwing me for a bone and I don't know where we're going, but I'm on, I'm here for the ride. I'm, I'm here for the ride. I want to talk about the creature really quick. I don't mm-hmm. spoil this away, but in terms of screenwriting for all my horror screenwriters out there, how do you describe this creature? Like what, what is the best tech? Are you describing him in detail or it in detail, or are you giving it more of a general description and then allowing another department to come in to really design it? In this case, I think I was fairly specific. I can't remember if, how specific I was on the page, but I knew I was going to direct it. So I had a very specific idea in mind and I put together a lot of picture references and a lot of images that I could bring were like texture and look and shapes and, and bringing everything to Illusion Industries who designed the monster and put it together. On the page, it's I, I think I described the noises that he makes, mm. which turned out to be different in the final picture because the way that I thought he would sound was the sound of twigs breaking when he moves. Mm. And it didn't quite, there's a little bit of that in the final mix, but it didn't quite 
come together the way that I wanted. But I think that even sometimes when you describe the sound, it gives you an idea of what it would look like as well. And, and that was one of the one of the hints that I gave for that. The basics were in there. And then, you know, when you make a monster, especially one like this one, which is kind of like, is this real? Is this not real? up until you find out it's always better to keep it as hidden as possible and to keep it as much in the protagonist's head as possible and kind of like even the way you film it is you see it in her point of view you never see it at a moment where she's not looking yeah. and that was in the script that was definitely in there already like we don't see too much it's a little bit shadowy or I, there's a lot of judith's pov kind of descriptions what do you, how do you feel um, about automatopoeias and scripts, like sound descriptions? Because horror, it, it kind of is hard not to use them, right? Because it's like the creaking of the door, the, yeah. you know, how do you feel I about that? Descriptives for sound, I love. I don't use automatopoeias all that much personally, but I have nothing against it. I think that anything that gets you there, anything that gives you an idea of, you know, the, the, of what you're supposed to be hearing or seeing, anything that creates that atmosphere is fair game. I'm not, I'm not huge on, I know there's a lot of guys who are very, very high on what the screenwriting rules should be for formatting. I, yeah. I, I would not resort to crazy things, but I think that within a certain scope, anything goes. You just, you're just you creating an experience for a viewer and you know, that's what matters. And then on, the, on this last topic for my last question, uh, what advice would you give your younger writer self? And that could be from your time on Sabrina. That could be from your time writing this film, but something that you've learned that you would like to share with others. I think when I was, when I started writing, I rejected structure very strongly. I thought that was something that uh, was limiting and was kind of, you know, you have that idea of you need your imagination to be more free and you don't want to work with the constraints of, and, and I learned with time that to me personally, I'm sure it's different for some other people, but to me, structure is, is my lifeline and it helps me write and it helps me get to the word, the, 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 the page count, and it helps me not go into crazy tangents and not come too short. And just kind of have a better understanding of how you plant a seed somewhere and it pays off somewhere else. And it's not just like sticking to a three act structure. It's not just like you need to have the, this character die at this point. It's more understanding that there are places where you plant those hints and places where they pay off. And this is how emotionally for the characters and also in terms of story and how the story progresses, this is how you make things have an impact. And it took me a very long time to figure that out. And when I realized that, and when I started understanding it and working through more structured outlines, it really made me a better writer. I love that, especially in horror, because yeah, I mean, it's a genre where you know, the formula can go out the window, but it's still there for the most part. And the really tight ones do have a formula that works. Um, so don't yeah. be afraid to write to that. <laughs> and when you think of it, even, even in Stephen King books, when I look back, I'm, I'm trying, I'm trying to find a, an example, but sometimes, sometimes you'll have something that happens and he plants the seed of something that pays off. And it's sometimes a very small little thing. And, and it's, oh, in The Shining, there's a scene in The Shining in the book where they hear at night, they hear the elevator go up and down. And when they go and they open the elevator door, there's confetti on the ground. And that's mm -hmm. all it is. And that's because previously we've had the description of a party scene and it's, the party scene itself was not necessarily scary, but just, and then you have this tiny little hint of something and it pays off something that he put there earlier. And it's terrifying and it's so subtle. And so, you know, it's, it's those kinds of things that mean that you can scare people without just having a loud sound or just having something jumping at you. You can, right. you can put an, have an atmosphere and, and have something creepy by just suggesting things that later pay off. Beautifully said. And I couldn't agree more. Well, Axel, this has been so amazing to talk to you today. I absolutely love the movie. Yes, it did give me a reaction that I wasn't prepared for, but I think that's uh, the best thing about movies. It depends on who watches it, what reaction you're going to get, right? It's all subjective. I think it's wonderful. I'm, I'm, again, I'm sorry that it brought up sad things, but I'm, I'm kind of delighted that it affected you. No, it, I, it was very cathartic because I hadn't thought about those moments in a while. So to cry them out and kind of just like get them out and then live vicariously through the characters through the screen and be scared at the same time. It was great. It was like, a I, nice release. sorry. And I, I think I want to emphasize that <laughs> it's not, I don't think at least maybe you felt differently, but I, I did not set out to make something that was particularly sad. I, the, the tone no. of it, even though we're dealing with heavy subject matters, 
it's very much, uh, I really made a point of trying to make it into something that feels a little bit more augmented reality, kind of a little bit more gothic and, and not, so it doesn't become no, no, a depressing this, experience. This is you. This is all my emotional am. <laughs> <laughs> this is all me. It's, you never know when things are going to hit you differently. That's true. Like, That's oh, very shoot. true. I thought I was a thug and now I'm sitting here crying, (laughs) but okay. Um, But I really can't wait to see what else you do. I'm so ecstatic to have met you, to see this beautiful room that you're in and to know that there is another horror fanatic woman out there who's just killing it in the game. So um, everyone, please go to Amazon. Welcome to Blumhouse. Watch The Manor by Axel Carolyn. And thank you so much for joining me. And I hope to have you back on the podcast. Thank you. That was so nice to meet you. I'm so happy. And I'm so glad you're a fellow horror fan. That's so awesome. Thank you. Yes. We'll have to share stories after this because I need more (laughs) Craven stories. I'm not done with you. (laughs) Thanks, you guys. See you next time. Thanks to Axel Carolyn for coming on the show and to Sharday Sellers for guest hosting. The Manor will be streaming on Amazon Prime on October 8th. And as always, thanks to you, our listeners. If you like this episode, leave us a review. And if you haven't already, subscribe on Apple, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts. For news about future episodes and more, like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter at Final Draft Inc. and Instagram at Final Draft Screenwriting. This episode was produced by Kayla Guess with help from associate producer Emma Vranich. Music by T. Kelly. Thanks again, everyone. Until next time, right on. Right on.